as we know, the future is inherently uncertain. And scenarios are tools that have been used by the research community for more than 30 years to help think about what the future could look like, understanding it's not one future, it's a whole range of possible futures. And to be able to inform decision makers, we need to look at that full range of possibilities. The National Academies were critical to this process. There was a meeting early on in this process. I think it might have been in this room, but Brian, you might remember better than me. Uh, it was during Snowmageddon in DC, and we were all sitting in the room intensely talking about scenarios and developing this new process. And Artmar Edenhofer, who was the predecessor to Jim Ski, rushed into the room at one moment and said, they're closing the airport and ran out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It was, it was dramatic, <laughs> it was quite a dramatic meeting, but it, it is a process that's been going on for more than a decade. And we do have a slightly different uh, approach today than what's listed on some of the agendas. We're gonna start with Brian O'Neill, who's been absolutely critical to the process of developing the shared socioeconomic pathways. When we look into the future, as I said, inherently uncertain, we wanna look into the future in ways that we can assess the results across regions, across sectors. And so the scenarios are used to look at developing projections where you do have some consistency and you can then aggregate the results. We wanna look at the risks going into the future. We wanna look at the responses, the effectiveness of those responses, and we need to integrate. We need to integrate within a region, we need to integrate for a sector across the world. And so these are tools that are used for those processes. There's been a few studies that have tried to disaggregate where are the major sources of uncertainty in our projections. The smallest source of uncertainty is in the climate modeling, although that's where the bulk of the funding has gone is into the climate modeling. The second source of uncertainty, which is larger than the climate modeling, is the impact modeling of how do we understand what kinds of risks could arise under what kinds of conditions when we have the what ifs. The major source of uncertainty is what we think about in terms of socioeconomic. How do we understand human behavior? How do we understand policymaking and governance and those critical factors that will determine the magnitude and pattern of risk? And so building on the work that was done for the special report on emission scenarios, this process was started more than a decade ago with two major elements. There are supposed to be three, but mostly there's two. One are the representative concentration pathways that talk about emissions going into the future. And the other are the socioeconomic pathways that talk about possible ranges. Brian's going to set that up for us first. And then we're going to hear from Jim Ski, the co-chair for working group three of the nearly completed AR6. Congratulations, Jim, on getting the uh, synthesis report approved. That was fantastic. We'll then hear from Wolfgang Lutz from EASA talking about demographics and demographic change, the drivers thereof. Heinrich Carlson is going to talk about some of the work that he's done on more uh, downscaled kinds of approaches to using these. The scenarios were set up at a global scale primarily because there was really no funding for all of this. And so it was set up at a global scale. And he's going to talk about some of his work in communities. And then Casper Koch is going to be talking about the work he's done in Europe, um, also on downscaling. A couple of other quick comments is you'll notice there's not a lot of diversity in the speakers. That's because, number one, the major funding source has been in Europe. That's why most of the speakers are European. Um, also, there's been an effort over the years to try and increase diversity in people engaged in scenarios. There was early funding from the State Department to uh, try to increase diversity. It's been a real challenge because with limited funding, we're asking people to volunteer a lot of time. And as you know, researchers in low and middle income countries just don't have the privilege of being able to do so. So with that as a stage, is there something else I'm supposed to say here, Stephen? Just get started. Okay. Good to go. We're good to go. So Brian, you're up first. Everybody has about 12 minutes and then we'll have five minutes for clarifying questions. And then we'll have a longer discussion at the end. Brian, take it away. 
Thanks, Chris. And let me share my screen here. Okay, you should be able to see that. <clears throat> um, well, thanks again uh, for that introduction. And as, as Chris said, I'm gonna talk about uh, the, the SSP RCP scenario framework, um, introduce it, talk about what it is, how it works. Um, I think many people will be referring to it. So we, we thought it would be good to make sure we're all on the same page before getting into deeper details. This may be familiar to, to some of you, maybe to many of you, uh, but, but again, probably not to all. Um, so, so in the interest of starting from a common base, uh, here, here we go. Um, let's start with the, the RCPs. Um, the RCPs are, are a set of what were at the time pre-existing concentration pathways that were drawn from the literature around the year 2010. Um, there are four of them, and they were intended to span the range of scenarios in the literature at that time. And that range is indicated here in gray, so you can see they, they do span that, that full range. Those scenarios concentration pathways were used in the CMIP-5 modeling exercise uh, to produce Earth system model simulations, which of course produced all kinds of spatially explicit Earth system variables. I'm just showing here the, the global average temperature outcomes, but the full set of results were then available for use in studies of impacts or, or adaptation or, or mitigation. So that's, that's the RCPs, these climate futures. The SSPs, or Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, are a set of five societal futures. Um, and these were produced to provide the important societal inputs to, to integrated studies. And they consist of uh, two types of information, um, qualitative narratives, that is text descriptions in broad terms of the logic of how the world may unfold in the coming decades along several different dimensions, um, as well as quantitative elements uh, at the national level for a number of key variables, population, GDP, uh, urbanization, education. Um, there, as you can see here, there were five SSPs that were developed, and you might ask, you know, why why these five, and how do we know when we've got a set of scenarios that we want that's sufficient? Well, <clears throat> the the idea is that at the beginning of the process, the point of the scenarios was defined up front, and that was decided to be that we want to span a range of uncertainty. And we want to span uncertainty in two dimensions, um, aspects of society that make it harder or easier to adapt to climate change and aspects of society that make it harder or easier to mitigate. So these were explicitly climate focused and climate response focused. Um, and you can see the way the, the scenarios were then, the, the SSPs were then developed uh, to fill different parts of this space. So SSP1 is in the lower left corner where it's a world that according to the way that many of the various social, demographic, economic, technological trends evolve, it's a world that has relatively low challenges to either adapt or mitigate. SSP3 in the upper right is the opposite where those challenges are both high SSPs four and five are scenarios in which one type of challenge dominates the other. And SSP two is our, our middle of the road scenario. So the way the SSPs and RCPs uh, are brought together um, are in this, this sketch of the, the overall framework here. And the, the point of this framework is that it's designed to facilitate the production of integrated scenarios and, and analyses, studies 
studies that bring together the societal futures and the climate futures to understand impacts, potential adaptation, potential mitigation. So that's why that's in the middle. Uh, that's the point of, of the whole framework is to facilitate those kind of studies. The elements arranged around the outside circle, you can think of as ingredients basically to a recipe for creating those integrated studies. Uh, and they can be combined in different combinations depending on the, the nature of the study that you're doing. So at the top, you'll see the RCPs and SSPs, which we just talked about. Um, the RCPs are concentration pathways. Again, they, uh, as we said, were run in the CMIP-5 uh, exercise to produce climate model simulations to, to use in integrated studies. The SSPs are the societal futures. Important to point out here is that the SSPs by themselves don't include climate, don't include climate impacts or adaptation or mitigation. Um, they don't include these types of policies. You can, of course, combine policy assumptions with the SSPs to look at mitigated futures or adaptation. And to help uh, organize policy assumptions, there are also a set of so-called SPAs or shared policy assumptions available for the community to use to, to um, use as one of the ingredients in, in their analyses if, if, if they'd like. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's how these different elements are brought together to integrated, for integrated studies. Now you see at the bottom right branch here, uh, there's one more feature, which is that the SSPs themselves were used to develop new scenarios of emissions and land use and concentrations. Uh, in integrated assessment models. Um, and those emissions and concentration pathways have already been used in the next round of climate modeling, the CMIP-6 exercise, to produce climate model simulations as well. So at the moment, you can combine societal futures with either the CMIP-5 or the CMIP-6 climate model simulations. Both, uh, both are now available. In um, in producing these integrated studies, it's been found by researchers that uh, oftentimes it's necessary to extend the SSPs to include information that was not included in the basic set that came with the original SSPs, the narratives, the population, GDP, urbanization uh, scenarios. Uh, a lot of times you need additional information. And so the research community has produced a lot of it that then is available for other researchers to use in their own studies. So some examples is that uh, income distributions within countries have been produced, for example, to look at issues of climate change and poverty. Spatial population projections have been produced to supplement the national level population projections that were part of the basic SSP information. Uh, this was, has been used in many um, exposure and, and impact studies. Uh, spatial, global spatial urban land projections consistent with the SSPs have also been produced to inform urban studies. Even uh, indexes of governance uh, have been produced consistent with the SSPs at the national level to inform studies of vulnerability and so on. There are actually extensions in many different sectors that have facilitated studies in those areas. And in addition, there have been some sort of downscaling of scenarios, which we'll hear more about later, to different regions uh, in the world. So the SSPs are in wide use, uh, have been since, since they came out. Um, at, at last count, which, which ended about a year and a half ago, there's more than 2,000 papers in the literature that uh, use the SSPs. Many of those uh, also uh, employ the RCPs in, in their analyses, and they cover a wide range of fields. You see here from this figure that about half of them in the dark blue are on impacts, uh, impacts and or uh, adaptation across a, a variety of sectors. Maybe a third are on 
energy land use emissions, including mitigation studies. Um, so they cover a, a wide range. And, and the framework has been used in some prominent um, assessments, uh, including in the IPCC, including in the, the last US uh, national climate assessment. Um, so we're, we're gonna hear lots more about use and challenges uh, for in assessments uh, as well as in research. Um, so, so Chris, I was going to stop here and then maybe come back later to talk about research needs. Uh, if, if that turns out to be useful, either way, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Thank you, Brian. That was really very helpful. And yes, the plan is to come back to you at the end to talk about research needs. The one point I'd like to expand on is when you look at the SSPs is they were designed as spaces. And so it was explicit from the beginning that there can be a whole range of scenarios that look like SSP1 or SSP2 or SSP3. And so that it is a way to start categorizing the diversity of scenarios that are produced in the literature. With that, Jim, I apologize that I didn't say that you're going to be up next. Jim's been running around the world doing really, I've seen a few very exceptional presentations about work on scenarios and all that he contributed to moving scenarios forward as the co-chair of Working Group 3. Jim? Okay, uh, th th thanks very much, Chris. And I hope you can see my screen uh, uh, you know, at this point. And just to, to flag up that I'm not actually an active modeler anymore. It must be 25 years since I wrote uh, computer code in earnest. My bigger role has been in either specifying or interpreting scenarios, both at the global level, but also at the national level. I spent more than 10 years as a member of the UK's Committee on Climate Change and, and spent a lot of time uh, kicking, kicking scenarios around. Um, so it, obviously you're going in a US direction. I necessarily take a global perspective and an IPCC perspective, and it will focus more heavily on mitigation. I'm just figuring out how to move my screen. Now, this is a slightly provocative slide, uh, which I'm asked more to borrow than any other slide I have ever produced. And just to flag up a very strong message we've had from governments in IPCC is that they would like to see a simple set of scenarios to help them illuminate their policy choices. And when we approved the Working Group 1 report in IPCC in this cycle, they reduced it to the ultimate level of simplicity. They wanted very low, low, intermediate, high and very high scenarios. Scientists are also, I think, really interested in the issue because scenarios are a really good integrating device uh, for pulling together different scientific domains, the physical sciences, mitigation, impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. And as a result of this, we have uh, derived a number of different concepts that try to bring things together. But it is proving difficult for governments, I think, and policymakers to always uh, you know, stay in tune with this. I noticed that in the background material uh, for uh, th this meeting, uh, that uh, there was a bold definition of scenarios and pathways. Just to flag that the, the IPCC glossary definition says that the term scenarios and pathways are used almost interchangeably, uh, which, which is not a very helpful uh, way forward. But uh, I, I think it's important to realize there is a lot of ambiguity in the terminology that you, that, that's actually used. Now, one thing also that I want to flag up is that often people refer to IPCC scenarios. There are no IPCC scenarios. There are scenarios produced by the community that are assessed by IPCC. 25 years ago, IPCC was producing its own scenarios, the so-called stress scenarios, the special report on emission scenarios. But there was a very active decision taken by IPCC around 2005 that IPCC should not own its, only scenario, or its own scenarios, but should only facilitate the development of new scenarios in the community. 
And as a, as a response to that, uh, there was a, a new body, for example, created the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium, and there were pre-existing uh, kind of bodies, and it was especially related to CMIP, uh, that Brian has mentioned that pre-existed uh, this decision by IIPCC. So I think just to be very clear, most of this activity, IPCC does not produce scenarios. Most of the activity is taking place in the community. And this, this really illustrates scenario design, scenario production, the development of the modeling tools lies with the scientific community. IPCC's job is to assess the, the results of the scenarios that go, have gone into the literature. But to fulfill this full facilitation objective, there are many bodies that are effectively intermediaries. And I would include the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium, the CMIP World Climate Research Programme process, and ICONIX, which I think Chris and Brian are both involved with, uh, which is more covers more the impacts, adaptation, vulner vulnerability side. But it's very clear there is a kind of feedback because the community is often working towards scenarios that can ultimately be assessed by IPCC and feed in, into global processes. Now, very obviously, you can think of, you can conceptualize this in terms of a, a kind of a causal chain that does not go working groups one, two, and three for IPCC. It goes working groups three, one, two, because causally you can obviously think of uh, you know, emissions taking place, which is working group three domain, working group one and kind of activity uh, takes this through to climatic conditions, which can be downscaled then to particular parts of the globe. And then this moves on to working group two, which you know, can assess various kind of indicators uh, that are relevant uh, you know, to vulnerability uh, climate impacts. So we have this kind of causal chain moving through in, in, in a particular direction. But this is not the approach that the community has taken since about 2005. The sequential approach was used uh, back in the time of the stress scenarios, but there was a very active decision about 2005 to follow the so-called parallel approach, which Brian has, has touched on here, with the idea of the representative concentration pathways as something that could be done to guide the work that was carried out both in the working group one world with the climate models and in the working group three world with the integrated assessment models. And what this did very obviously was by starting in the middle of the causal chain was that allowed people to work in parallel and it, 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 it got over some of the issues around timing uh, that, that were there as we waited for the emission scenarios uh, to, to be produced. And just a flag that to relate this to policy process, the reason for focusing on concentrations goes back to Article 2 of the Convention on Climate Change, which talks about stabilising greenhouse gas concentrations at a level that will prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference. And it's very interesting with the Paris Agreement, we've much more focused on the question of warming levels uh, as, the, uh, as the, the most important uh, sort of policy guide. So building on uh, exactly in what Brian has said, and thanks to Brian's presentation, I don't need to go into detail here, but we have the combination of the representative concentration pathways and the shared Swiss economic pathways, which you can use to produce this kind of matrix at the bottom right hand corner, because uh, different different uh, so shared socioeconomic pathways can be associated with different warming levels and the same warming level might be associated with different uh, socioeconomic pathways. Uh, so you can produce this kind of matrix here, but the community decided to identify so-called tier one scenario classes. Uh, which uh, are illustrated by the dark blue there, because it is quite clear that some combinations of SSP and RCP are more plausible than others. So we have this kind of picture. And so for the sixth assessment report in working group one, it was the five scenarios in, that are through which this red line passes that were chosen as the key scenarios that were, uh, were portrayed in working group one and which the government signed off as very low, low, intermediate, high and very high. And that was the kind of, of background to them.
Now, one thing going into the working group uh, three domain particularly is the importance of the carbon budget or cumulative carbon dioxide emissions as a concept. And this follows from the strong AR5 conclusion that there is a very strong quasi-linear relationship between cumulative carbon dioxide uh, emissions and the level of warming. Therefore, if you want to limit uh, warming to a particular level, as implied by the Paris Agreement, then you should also be looking to limit cumulative carbon dioxide emissions in the same way. And in many cases, the integrated assessment models, I should say in many cases, not always, they have been run so as to meet a cumulative level of carbon dioxide emissions throughout the 21st century. And this then inevitably, uh, the way the models work, attempting in most cases to minimize costs, that this results in the kind of net emissions trajectory that you can see in this diagram marked in black. So you tend to see uh, agriculture, forestry and land use emissions going negative during the 21st century, energy sector emissions going to zero uh, sometime mid-century and substantive uh, reductions in emissions from the demand side in buildings, transport and industry, but never actually getting to zero. And that is then complemented by negative emissions, uh, for example, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and emissions avoided through fossil fueled uh, carbon capture and storage. And this is an inevitable way of it's put together. If you're going to limit cumulative emissions and if you're going to discount future costs, this is the inevitable kind of outcome uh, that you, you get from, from these scenarios. I want to flag that some, some of the colleagues in a European Union funded project actually uh, were responded to a lot of criticism about negative carbon dioxide emissions by trying a kind of two stage approach to setting budgets throughout the, the 21st century. The first carbon budget is set to the point of net zero carbon dioxide emissions, but then you set a zero carbon budget out to the year 2100 after that. And basically the, the, the pink kind of scenarios on this is the slide are a one stage carbon budget. The two stage budget is rep represented by the blue stage, the blue scenarios, which uh, stop reducing somewhere around mid century and then grow, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in aggregate continue at a roughly constant level for the remainder of the century and never reach net net zero. It's worthwhile flagging that many countries have criticized these blue scenarios because they say it's not compatible with Article 4 of the Paris Agreement, which looks between a balance of sources and sinks of greenhouse gases. And just to say, in Working Group 3, there have been two kind of approaches for making sense at the many, many hundreds of scenarios that, that are assessed here. The first approach is to pick out a small number of so-called illustrative mitigation pathways. And these are shown on, on the right hand side. It's showing the characteristic of emissions and sinks at the point of net zero carbon dioxide emissions, which is basically telling the story that it is still possible to get to net zero, but there are different strategies for getting to net zero, which involve different balances of removals and different balances of emissions in particular sectors. And the other way of do, being doing it is to take these hundreds of scenarios and try to bin them or allocate them into particular categories and then perform a semi statistical analysis on the outcomes of these scenarios for things like changes in the energy sector, uh, ch changes in, in land use. So what happened, uh, our colleagues at the in International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, uh, where Wolfgang is based, have created a database for these scenarios and they have filtered them. Many of the scenarios this time were national or sectoral. So they've taken out, included only the global ones. They've vetted them for compatibility with historic trends and they've checked them to see if they actually have enough information to run through uh, reduced complexity climate models. And as a result, uh, 1,200 scenarios in all were categorized 
according to the warming level by the end of the century and the likelihood with which that level would be ad adhered to. So quite a complicated process and there were lots of decisions taken there about how these scenarios should be vetted uh, and, and characterised. So just the, the, the novelty in AR6 was that uh, for the first time we, there were national, regional, sectoral scenarios included in the assessment and the database. And there was a much bigger effort to enhance transparency, uh, which, uh, for which the scenario community had been criticised in the past. So the scenarios database for the sixth cycle has input assumptions as well as model outputs, which is a novelty. And we also included an annex on scenarios and mo modelling methods in an attempt to explain just, just what the basis for the models and the scenarios were. And worthwhile flagging on that, the, the aim in my, from my view was to communicate it to non-modelers and users. I think it's much more successful actually at the end of the day uh, in explaining it to fellow modelers what's going on. So uh, personally, I think there's a little more work on transparency needed. So uh, let me skip this one because I think it'll come, come on. But one of the issues I think that we need, do need to address is the question of the inclusiveness and diversity of the scenarios that were assessed. Of the 1202 scenarios in the global scenarios in the AR6 database, more than 90% were based on the middle of the road shared socioeconomic pathway, and a very small percent based on SSP, SSP1, sustainable development, and even smaller amounts on the other SSPs. There is also a big uh, bias in terms of the different models or modeling families that are included in the database. So you can see that three more than three quarters of the scenarios in the database were accounted for by only five models. And these models happen to be all models supported uh, by the European Commission, I should say. So very interesting issues on, on diversity there, which we do need to work on. So I think these are the kind of issues that we have with the, the scenario process at the moment uh, that, that we will be addressing in a workshop, which I'll just come on to as a final slide. Concentration in a small number of models and modeling teams, the question of inclusivity in scenario design and scenario architecture. And I noticed, Brian, you, pick, you picked up the issue of uh, how equalities are dealt with in the SSPs. And this is something which we got a lot of brutal commentary on from governments, uh, some governments during the Working Group 3 approval. The boundary between what, belong, what is research belonging to the community and what is assessment belonging to IPCC does get blurred. And for example, the vetting process I just mentioned for scenarios took place inside the IPCC fence. You could argue that that should have been done outside, subject to full peer review. And we also have some more administrative issues around the, the database. It was a big administrative burden for modelling teams to submit to the scenarios database in the last cycle, which I think partly explains the big concentration uh, for, for particular models. Also, a very short time between the cutoff date for literature and our final government draft submission. So only six or seven weeks time for the, for, for the actual authors of the particular chapter to assess all the scenarios. I'll, I'll just do a, a little kind of advertisement that, you know, to address many of these issues. Next week, there is going to be a workshop on scenario, IPCC workshop on scenarios, which will take place in Bangkok that has a mixture of scientific aims, which, you know, you're on the screen. I can leave the, the presentation behind uh, and uh, uh, I'm, for the, I'm very happy for people to have that. Uh, but also, for example, to consider the degree to which the R RCP SSP framework is still serving as well, because some, some governments in particular would argue that it doesn't cover the full range of possibilities, especially in, in relation to equity. It also has process aims. We're we'll also be thinking about developing cross working group collaboration further. I should say it was absolutely excellent on scenarios between working groups one and three 
in, in the last cycle. Work in progress on working group two, sorry, Chris, Chris and, and Neil, in terms of, of the, Brian, in terms of the scenarios. To think about the institutional mechanisms, thinking about how the scenario data is being curated, and to think about getting increasing further the diversity of contributors to the scenario building process. So I'll, I'll call it to a halt there. And I, I know that there are several people on the call who will be in Bangkok next week. So look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. That was really excellent. As I put in the chat, we just have time for one question. If somebody online or in the room has a question for Jim, we will have a longer period for discussion at the end. Uh, Brian, I didn't ask for questions on your presentation because you're gonna talk again later and I was gonna combine the questions at that point. Anybody have any questions? I don't see a hand raised. Rob? Jim, the, it was extraordinarily surprising and and meaningful i think that 90 plus percent of the ssbs were number two modeling was about number two uh what explains that i mean that that's that almost undermines the entire idea of spanning a space rob i, I was so disappointed when we got to the stage to see this concentration on on one set of ssps I think the explanation is that uh, you know, a lot of a lot of these were based on modeling intercomparison projects that were supported by the European Commission, and the question, the policy relevant questions that were asked didn't touch on comparing the different socioeconomic backgrounds. They were asking other questions about timing, uh, about the degree to which uh, there was involvement in, in sort of global efforts on climate change, how inclusive it actually was. And I think the message has gone through. I mean, I've, I've been at meetings in Brussels since then about which we've talked about these very issues. But I think it, it really is a call you know, for diversity and letting a, a thousand followers grow as it were in terms of uh, scenario development and utilization is important. Because for me, it was very disappointing to see that. Uh, we, we could, had we had more SSP1s in particular, there are, that we could have developed much stronger evidence around some of the lines and findings in the IPCC report. Thank you, Jim. I think another issue was there was a process funded by the German government that uh, provided consistency in terms of using, for example, some of the climate modeling data, but then only used SSP2 demographic data and nothing else. And there's been a, there's been a diversity since then, but there were initial processes that really limited the, the broad applicability of the SSPs to questions of relevance for policymakers. With that, I would like to turn to Wolfgang. And Wolfgang, you have multiple hats. I know that you're what the temporary interim executive director at IASA. You you run a demographic modeling group and other illustrative things, of which I hope you'll articulate much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, greetings from Vienna. Um, so I've been for 25 years heading the world population program at YASA and currently serve as scientific director for the whole institute. Now let me try to share the screen. Um, I think it's uh, worthwhile stepping back a little. And when we talk about demographic trends, ask ourselves first uh, what it is that we are looking at, because most people think it's only population size or it's only the age structure. So the classic definition of our discipline is it is a scientific study uh, of changing population size and structures. And note that structures is stated in plural, referring to multiple structures and not just the age structure. So uh, we developed this concept that uh, we called a multi-dimensional demography, where we study population structures by of course, age and sex, which are the primary demographic uh, dimensions, but other uh, characteristics of people as well, such as place of residence, educational attainment level, labor force participation, ethnicity, or in the US would use the words uh, race, 
Uh, what are the variables? Well, these are all the variables that have been traditionally collected in censuses. Or if you have a survey, there are sort of in a demographics box, what do you want to know about this um, interviewed person? And uh, we try to show that this multidimensional approach really makes the study of changing population structures much more relevant uh, for sustainable development than the more conventional limited focus only on population size or the age structure. So uh, let's just look at the world population in 1950, you see here in the back. So what we did essentially is just add to the well-known uh, education pyramid where you have women on the right and men to the left uh, sorted by age. You see in 1950, the world really looked like a pyramid. We added color as the third dimension in dark red, meaning men and women who have no education whatsoever. They never had the opportunity to go to school. And then the light, the pink one is primary education, some primary and the light blue, some secondary. And in 1950, there was very little with post-secondary education. Now on the right-hand side, you see uh, the total population as of 2020. So in, in the meantime, it had reached 8 billion, where it was two and a half billion in 1950. And you see that the, first of all, the age structure has changed a bit. We have fertility has now started to decline and the pyramid is a bit more narrow at the bottom, uh, but in particular education has expanded tremendously. Uh, but we still have about a billion people in, in dark red. That is uh, what Paul Collier called sort of the bottom billion. And then you have sort of a, uh, a little more than a billion people already with post-secondary education. Well, this is the global pattern that hides uh, significant uh, regional differences. And I just like to show you this fascinating pyramid for South Korea, which really had the world's most rapid education expansion and also uh, one of the most rapid uh, demographic transitions. So this is Korea in 1960. It was a really very poor developing country at that point. You see fertility all until recently there had been about six or seven children. So the pyramid is very wide at the bottom. And you see in dark red that virtually every woman above the age of 35 was without any education. For, for men, it had this, this the education expansion started a little earlier. This is a very typical pattern. But what you also really see is this inter-cohort difference is why the elderly people are without education. The young ones uh, have already benefited from the rapid education expansion. And for the 15 to 19 year old, more than half already had some secondary education. Now, uh, then uh, these uh, more educated cohorts move step-by-step step up the age pyramid. And here you see uh, Korea in 2020, it looks like a completely different country. Um, and uh, well, we don't have time to talk about all the other social and economic consequences of this rapid increase in human capital, but it was precisely when these more educated young adults came into the main working ages that you had this very rapid economic growth rate in the Asian tiger countries and uh, particularly in Korea. So what you see that today, uh, fertility is very low. The age pyramid is very narrow at the bottom because Korea now has the world's lowest uh, fertility rate just around 0.7 children per woman, which is about a third of the so-called replacement level. And you see that uh, almost half of the young cohorts, both of men and women, are these days uh, having uh, some post-secondary tertiary education. And this is part of the reason why the fertility is so low, because under these traditional family norms, um, uh, educated women choose to have a professional career rather than to stay home with uh, having children. But what you also see here is that, that the elderly, particularly women, you still have some of these um, women who were at the school age uh, in the 1950s when Korea still didn't have a functioning school system. So this process of complete societal change uh, through the cohort replacement we call also demographic metabolism. Korea is uh, boring when we look into the future, so I uh, chose a somewhat more extreme country, Nigeria, and here I'm not using SSP2, but I used the two more extreme scenarios, SSP1, uh, which in the social terms we call sort of the, the rapid social development and SSP3 uh, stalled social development. So at Yasa, we've reconstructed this for all countries in the world, this education and age structures back to 1950. So you see the historical trend uh, and you see uh, 
Yeah, up until recently in, in Nigeria, you had the half of the adult population is still in dark uh, red, meaning no education whatsoever. You still have many children. That's the gray area below under the age of 15. But then uh, education expansion has also kicked in. Uh, but uh, Korea, uh, Nigeria is still sort of at the crossroads. They have their fertility rate declined from more than seven to at the moment somewhere around 4.5. Um, so it's not sure that it will continue rapidly along the uh, demographic transition. It may well be that there is a stalled development if Boko Haram, the um, Islamic movement in, in the north of Nigeria, where actually translated Boko Haram means that education is sin. So if they uh, take over, then the uh, population expands still very rapidly. There's still many young children. And if the school enrollment rates are only constant or even go down, then we may see what is there in SSP3. Then the population may increase to close to a billion by the end of the century. See, it was uh, just 50 million by in, in 1950 or below 50 million. And uh, the very rapid development, SSP1 still sees an increase uh, to somewhat below 400 million. So there will be uh, population growth, uh, but uh, of course the right-hand side, the SSP3 will be twice as big the country and much more vulnerable because as you see, uh, actually an absolute number even of uneducated people will uh, continue to expand there and there will be a much lower level. So this brings me now to my most important, uh, actually the only slide I originally intended to show that gives you uh, this circular relationship between the human population and uh, global climate change. Uh, so um, uh, there, there are sort of several main messages here. The first message is that it is indeed we humans, we are the ones uh, through our greenhouse gas emissions who cause the climate change. Uh, but we will also be affected uh, by climate change. So it's the vulnerability, the adaptation to already unavoidable climate change that needs to be of concern. The second main message here is uh, that in the, you see two pyramids here in the population. The one is time T, that is the current time. And uh, that is where we, uh, through our consumption behavior, um, cause uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, then uh, the population at time T plus X at some point in the future uh, will be vulnerable and affected by these uh, climate changes. So the, the important thing here is uh, that uh, the climate is changing, uh, but the human societies are also changing. And this is often forgotten. I've seen so many studies where uh, sort of people try to assess I don't know, the additional malaria deaths due to uh, climate change in East Africa. What they did is take the climate, let's say of the year 2070, but match it with today's population, today's public health capabilities, uh, today's uh, uh, yeah, uh, societies. And uh, this, of course, is, is makes no sense. The question is, what tools do we have to anticipate social change? And uh, here, this multidimensional population modeling in particular with respect to education, uh, offers a very powerful tool uh, that as we've seen also, we can with quite some certainty uh, look 60 or more years into the future. Uh, because if you know how many 20 year old women have a sort of high school graduation today, we know well about uh, how many 80 year old women 60 year down the road uh, will also have high school um, graduation, and this uh, is associated with uh, better health uh, and uh, very different institutional settings and so on. So we don't have time to discuss all the benefits of education, but it is a very uh, forceful uh, way of, of, of forecasting, at least getting one analytical handle on modeling uh, society's future. Uh, coming back to this circle, it is not only our consumption behavior that is uh, also impacted by the size of the population, the age structure, also labor force participation, and as well as education and uh, higher education typically resulting in higher income and in higher income and higher consumption. But it's also the uh, technology, the development of green technologies that depends uh, particularly on the human capital uh, 
uh, of these populations we are looking at. So we are causing the problem, but uh, to some degree, uh, we are also the ones that develop the green technologies that then can help uh, to mitigate or through uh, other behavioral changes, uh, mitigate uh, climate change. Now let's look at the, uh, the right-hand side. Uh, there is already quite clear that there is some in climate change is going on and some more is, seems to be inevitable. So how does it affect the human population? Well, there is, of course, some direct effects on health and mortality through disaster, death, or uh, whatever. But probably the, the more relevant uh, issue also is the impact on, on livelihoods. And that uh, has also impacts then on uh, starving people if there's a, a drought and a famine. Uh, but a very important uh, aspect here is the migration, is sort of climate change induced migration. This is a very big research topic at the moment, both in terms of internal migration as well as international migration. And then of course you have uh, the, the mortality, you have the migration and then fertility. That is a bit more controversial, how much climate change will have impacts uh, on the future birth rates. And there are currently many studies going on and the, the opinions uh, differ uh, quite significantly. But the key message again is that we are uh, when we look at the uh, sort of uh, vulnerability of future populations, uh, we really need to try to anticipate what is the adaptive capacity uh, of these future uh, populations. And uh, the economist has uh, recently reviewed some of these evidence and put it into a nice short uh, headline that climate change is harder on less educated people. I think I'll stop with this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. That was really excellent. Um, you were you were a bit kinder than I am about the health sector. Uh, three quarters of the projections assume the world everything in the world stays the same, only temperature changes, yeah. and it's really problematic. It's also a bit problematic with some of the migration work because it's doing exactly the same thing. And as we sit here, one of the people in the room is the head of the National Climate Assessment and thinking about migration and how important migration is. But we really have to understand what's happening outside our borders in terms of demographic change. So there's lots of ways that this will be incredibly interesting and useful going forward. We have time for just a couple of questions. Sarah, did you have a question? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Wolfgang. It's great to, <clears throat> great to see you after many years. Um, I uh, had a couple questions about how you've been thinking around, um, and I loved your multidimensional approach and uh, really appreciate that. I was wondering about how you've been thinking about temporal dimensions of your, uh, of these, um, changes, you know, how, how you mentioned briefly uh, cohort replacement and um, I, th I was just wondering how you think we should be thinking about timeframes and, and, and that as well as downscaling um, and thinking about subnational or even smaller local community modeling of uh, uh, demographic dynamics in, in your approach. Well, thank you, Sarah. Uh, this is a very relevant questions indeed. Uh, the, the temporal dynamics um, is uh, really uh, sort of set uh, by the sort of the length of the human lifespan, which is in most countries above 70 years now. So if we know how many babies have recently been born, we have a good analytical handle about uh, how many uh, 70, 80 year olds will be living in 70, 80 years in the future. And as I said, also uh, the educational attainment is something that is typically acquired at young age. Uh, so if we know, as I said, how many men or women got high school graduation, now we really can also uh, project, uh, at least for these cohorts, uh, the educational attainment in the longer term future with all the positive consequences and, and other consequences. The same is true with the place of residence, uh, urbanization. Of course, there's a bit more moving back and forth, and we uh, sort of uh, are projecting the stock and it, it changes then only through the flow at uh, the margin. Uh, so in, in other words, this uh, process that it has been called by the 
the Princeton uh, demographer Norman Ryder, demographic metabolism. Uh, is this a cohort replacement, which I should say it's it's moving slowly, but steadily and with great predictive power. So this is really sort of a, a slow moving because of the inertia and this long average length of the human lifespan. Now, what you just said about uh, the spatial dimension, that is, of course, a big challenge. The SSPs at the moment still have the urbanization projection not yet uh, fully integrated uh, with these age, sex, and education projections. And, and that is uh, something we are just now working on to have it better integrated. And then we've done this for individual countries, such as in India, we have it for all the states and within each state, urban, rural. And then, of course, we want to downscale to do even much smaller uh, spatial units. But then it becomes a data problem. At the same time, uh, we want to maintain the rich multidimensionality. There are many downscale efforts, as you know, for just total population size, but having a full age structure, having a full education structure, that is more of a challenge. But uh, we are moving in that direction. And clearly in the future, what we'd like to see is something that is multidimensional and very spatially explicit. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. And in the interest of time, we are going to move on to Heinrich. Heinrich, are you ready to present? Indeed, I am, Chris. Thank Excellent. you. I'll try to share my screen here. Should be this one. And it's still in present. It's still yeah, um... like this. That's okay. Can Perfect. you see the screen? That's great. Thanks. Okay, so here I go. Uh, so first, thank you organizers for the opportunity to share some thoughts on on, on scenarios. And, and now we will dig a little bit deeper and, and the point of departure will be more on the sub-national scale compared to the previous talks. So I will try to go into impacts and adaptation studies primarily from a scenarios point of view and focusing on the sub-national scale, but also have some outlook to the global scale. So. So how, how is local adaptation contextualized in, in both socioeconomic and climate scenarios? That's the sort of starting point here for what I'm, I'm trying to, to talk about today. And, and the approach that we take, uh, the community that myself and, and uh, I'm sure that Casper will go along similar lines after me, is that we are, are often working on, on the ground in subnational uh, locations to study impacts and adaptation. And one of the things that we are doing is to, to try to develop scenarios together with stakeholders and problem owners. So this is, this is key for us to work together with stakeholders and developing scenarios. And there is a big and I think quite important distinction that I would like to make up front. And this is between creating new knowledge based on existing scenarios versus producing new scenarios. And the first case here, uh, producing new knowledge based on existing scenarios, that is usually what, you, what we see on, on the global level, that people are trying to interpret the scenarios and using the scenarios for global studies. Whereas what we do mostly often in, in local impact adaptation vulnerability studies is to produce new scenarios, sometimes based on, for example, the SSPs. But the important starting point is that we start bottom up and not top down. So why should such studies, local impact adaptation studies, care about global socioeconomic scenarios? This is a question that, uh, not only me, but the community has pondered upon these questions for, for quite some time now. And one of the design parameters for the new scenario architecture, the RCP SSP architecture, was actually to increase comparability across case studies regarding impact, mostly impacts, but also vulnerability studies. Because this is, as, as uh, both Wolfgang and Chris has alluded to, this is a big problem in, in, in mostly in working group two, I would argue that we have some problems in accumulating new knowledge based on case study after case study. Because of this simple fact that, that Chris and Wolfgang mentioned that people use perhaps the same climate signal, but they do, nothing regarding the, the, the socioeconomic development. In, some, in most cases, society stays as it is. And in other cases, scenarios are developed, socioeconomic scenarios are developed independent of any 
comparability across different regions of the world. So, so this is one very important and, and a driving force because, uh, and behind the work that I'm trying to do. The other point that has been raised sometimes is methodological guidance. It is difficult, it's complex, and it's time consuming. It's, it uh, eats up your resources quite quickly when doing this kind of, of development of scenarios together with local stakeholders. And uh, some methodological guidance from the global level down to the local and subnational levels would be good in order to increase uptake of scenario development processes. The third point for increased legitimacy. Yeah, well, sometimes I hear that people are, are, are happy to work within the, in the framework of a global architecture, sometimes not. So I'm not so sure about this, this last point. I will come back to this in an example later on. So combining climate and socioeconomic data, where to put the emphasis? As I said, it's very, very complex to build those integrated scenarios at, at the, at the subnational scale. And this figure here is quite old now, Hawkins and Sutton going back to 2009, is a good starting point, I think, in order to discuss where to spend your resources when it comes to handling the uncertainty. This figure shows the, the relative uncertainty on, on the vertical axis as a function of lead time on the horizontal axis with regards to the climate signal only. And you see, for example, I think you, you quite quickly realize that the green area here represents emission uncertainty. Uh, and you see that in the near term, emission uncertainty is quite narrow. And as was said before, that it's important to try to to make some assessment, what are the key uncertainties that we need to deal with in different time perspectives? And I think this figure can be used in order to draw some conclusions with regards to how to study impacts and annotation. If we imagine that we have at the bottom of, of a figure, a time axis, and the shortest time perspective we consider in, in, a, in a typical project could be something like one generation, I really like to work with this one generation, two generation frame rather than seeing 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. People tend to understand better what I mean when I'm talking about generations. But let's imagine that we have three different time scales here, one generation into the future, two generations into the future, and something along the lines of 100 years, which is rarely the case regarding impacts and adaptation studies, but, but for, for, for the example here. So if one work in near term, one generation time perspective, I think it's, it's fair to say then, based on the, on the previous figure, that the uncertainty with regard to emission is quite low, relatively low. So here, the proposal is to work with one emission scenario and, and span the space with regards to the socioeconomic uncertainty more than the emission uncertainty. So in this case, we get four integrated scenarios where the two arrows meet. The, these are the uh, the so-called integrated scenarios combining climate futures with socioeconomic futures. Um, moving into the future now, going into two generations, 50, 60 years into the future, something like that, I think it's fair to increase the, the amount of, of, of resources you spend on, on spanning the uncertainty space with regards to emissions. So here I propose working with two emission scenarios and then to not make things too complicated, narrow down the, 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 the um, number of socioeconomic futures to work with. Of course, you can argue the more longer into the future we look, the more uncertain the socioeconomic development is. So you should, everything else equal, work with more socioeconomic scenarios going into longer into the future. But I think it's also, especially working together with stakeholders, important to work with a limited number of scenarios to get the message across. And the argument goes, goes on like this. I think when talking about the RCP uh, dimension and the SSP dimension generally, I think this, this aspect of the time perspective that we are, are interested in is a little bit under discussed. So I think one should put some more emphasis in, in trying to figure out what are the key uncertainties in relation to the time perspectives we are interested in. Uh, I would now like to mention just the few criteria for good scenario development. And the usual ones is, is on your left, the relevance, plausibility, and representativeness, or, or representative. Uh, 
And the interesting thing is, uh, I think, is that relevance and plausibility apply to individual scenarios in a set. All scenarios should, of course, be relevant for the question we are studying. And all scenarios should, if not being uh, likely, or we don't usually uh, attach uh, probabilities to scenarios, they should at least be plausible. Whereas a representative, that's a property of the set of scenarios. This is not a property that you can uh, uh, tag to individual scenarios. This is a, a property of the set of scenarios if you work with three, four, five, or six scenarios. I will try to illustrate this. So imagine that we use this, uh, yeah, okay, scenarios and storylines are used interchangeable. That was mentioned before by, I think it was Jim. It, I use the, 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 the term storyline in this simple matrix, but it's sim similar to socioeconomic futures. Let's imagine that we have three strategies that we assess across those four storylines, A, B, C, and D. And uh, according to what we see here, strategy one or two is something that we would prefer, given those four uh, storylines that we assess the strategies against. But what if now we, we forgot or uh, for some reason, we missed out some storylines or some scenarios that makes strategy one and two perform very, very badly. Then the picture is, is totally different and we should probably go for strategy number three. So the conclusion for this, from this very simplistic reasoning is that it's important when trying to represent a huge number of possible scenarios to try to span the space as much as possible. And this was also mentioned, I think it was Robert who mentioned this, when uh, someone showed that only SS, mo most uh, IMs are using SSP2. And this goes directly in counter to the idea of spanning the space of possibilities. So instead of doing merging everything into the middle, we should of course try to span the space and pick those scenarios that are on their outer edge here. So together they span a bigger area. And what kind of, of, of area this is, is of course dependent on what kind of scenarios we're discussing. It could be simple, uh, sim simple one-dimensional measures, but this could also be multi-dimensional measures. For example, if you study different dimensions with different states for, for spanning the space of socioeconomic possibilities. But it, there are methods out there now that can help in, in trying to span the space in a mathematical sense as much as possible. And I think given the turbulent times we are living in, I think this, this notion of spanning the space of possibilities is becoming more and more important. Okay. Rick, just this noting is something that we, three minutes left. Sorry? Three minutes sorry? left. Yep. How many, five or three? Three. Three, wow. Okay, I will go to uh, an example then. I will talk a little bit about cross-border impacts of climate change because I think this illustrates very, very clearly the importance of the socioeconomic signal when studying impacts of climate change. This we have known for, for quite some time now that the causes of climate change is a truly global problem, whereas the effect of climate change has mostly being studied in isolation in each and every country, not taking imported climate risks into account. So this is the usual picture that we see over and over again, that the vulnerability looks something like this. And you can really ask yourself, do we learn anything new? If we, for example, plot those can all countries against climate vulnerability on one axis and human development in index on the other one, then we see that they, they nicely a line, a straight line that like this. And I think in an increasingly globalized world, this is perhaps not the whole story. So the bottom line is that in traditional assessment of climate impacts, the impacts and response take place more or less in the same region. Whereas when it comes to cross-border impacts of climate change, their impacts happens in one region and the response happens somewhere else. And this is what has been called cross-border impacts of climate change. So this Thailand flooding of, 20, of 2011 was perhaps the primary example so far about what can happen with extreme weather events and, and disruptions to, to global supply chains. So we did a study in Kenya trying to understand and using global scenarios in order to understand what are the global development that influences the future impacts of climate risks that might impact Kenya. Uh, 
Um, we described and built socioeconomic scenarios bottom up, as I described earlier on, and focusing on those climate risks that are not uh, from Kenya itself, but are imported. And then we link those scenarios to global RCPs and SSPs. And we used some, also some global, global modeling and created what we call scenario packages, trying to describe the situation in Kenya in relation to those climate risks that are imported so that we could develop adaptation options and assess adaptation options. So what we did when, when developing the scenarios was first using only stakeholders and trying to identify drivers of importance to understand future vulnerability in Kenya. And then after that, we introduced the global scenarios. So we started with not using the global scenarios and we used them instead of trying to interpret the different drivers in Kenya given different global context as described in the, these different SSPs. So in this way, we described, we laid out skeletons for local scenarios that were compatible with the global storylines. And I think when going from studying localized impact and adaptations to studying impacts of climate change that cross borders, I think this, the case for global socioeconomics is even stronger. You, in order to understand the future threats to, to Kenya, you need to understand the socioeconomics in Kenya, you need to understand the socioeconomic development globally, and you also need to understand the socioeconomic development from which those countries you import climate risks. So this extra I skip in interest of time, this is about AI and scenarios, which is perhaps important to discuss sometimes else. I'm sorry this was a bit, bit rushed, but this was what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heinrich. That was really great. And apologies to have to rush you, but we only have limited time and we've got two more presentations and then we're going to open up for general discussion. Casper, are you ready? I see you're online, but ready when you are. We're ready. Looking forward very much to your presentation. Thank you so much for joining. I hope the whole audience is still ready. I noticed that I'm getting kind of at the tax of how much information I can take in, which is, so oh, let me see which screen should I share? Is there one that's useful for this? Why not? Yeah, that one. There we go. And I have heard most of those stories before, and I'm still kind of at the limit of what I can take in. So I hope you have uh, uh, have room for one more. Somehow it doesn't want to go in presentation mode. Let me try this way. Yes, that's better, is it? That's better, thank you. Yeah, so so my name is Kasper Koch, and I also want to thank everybody, Chris especially, I think, for inviting me to speak at this meeting. When preparing this presentation, I realized I have way too much. And of course, my, my way of doing is putting it all in one presentation and rush it all through. And I'm, I'm sure you, don't, you won't be able to follow all that, but I think there's just simply so much going on at the non-global level of SSP development that is worthy of at least touching upon that I, that I did need to, to leave it all in. And that includes actually a little bit of the scale concept. I, I decided to focus only on multi-scale scenarios. That's been my kind of red thread throughout my career, either using multi-scale models or multi-scale scenarios or multi-scale stakeholder workshops. And I think there's a lot to be said on how to do that best. And I've tried to give you some highlight of it. And there's a little bit of backgrounds, and then there's a tiny bit of time for best practice examples. And I'll highlight one particular project that both me and Henrik have been involved in, and then summarize all of that in a minute or so, I hope. But please correct me if I have less time than I think I have. Why starting with ecological theories? Not to give you a lecture, but multi-scale scenarios have been around almost as long as scenarios have been around. And I think it's, it's good to realize that it's absolutely necessary, in my view, to do multi-scale scenarios. If you talk at any theme on any issue at any scale that is not global, called here the focal level, there is a larger scale above where there are slower processes happening over larger scales. And there are 
smaller processes acting over much shorter time, time scales. Part of that already Henrik touched upon. And to understand what's happening at any scale, you need to understand at least some of what happens at the scale above and at the scale below. There's beautiful books written in ecology about it, and some of that transfers to integrated systems, some doesn't. I'll, I'll skip it for now. There's also a dozen of these kinds of diagrams around that kind of plot out space and time, and you, you roughly see a diagonal, which the very, very large scale processes, be it climate change or economic crises, you see this figure is somewhat old when that was in play, you can add the pandemic. If you want to understand spatial planning at, at state level, for example, but then, you know, household income might also be important to, to, to take into account. I have two animals here that try to get all my attention. Well, they shouldn't. <laughs> okay, this particular paper is 15 years old, and I think it's un been underused. It's been written in the aftermath of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which is later followed up by the IPES on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It's worth revisiting. I do it all the time. This paper lays out the foundation of how to set up a scenario development process. It was written for global assessments, but it applies to different scales, in which the top half tells you what kind of scenarios at different scales do you want to uh, reach and how comparable, how similar should those be from completely complementary to completely the same, which they call equivalent. And then the bottom half tells you what type of process you should embark upon in order to get those scenarios. It's very conceptual, but it's, it's something that, that a lot of people haven't thought about until they're in the middle of the process, realizing they're not doing it the right way. So that's just saying that that paper is worth reading. This is 10 years later when we were asked to, to, to give input to the new process of global scenario development for the IPES. And we came up with a little paper. This was supposed to be a cock and cock paper, simply because I know somebody else with my surname. Of course, many other people joined the party. There we laid out three different options for IPBES itself, where one was use existing scenarios, in this case, the, the global SSPs. Two was develop completely new scenarios. And three is use local scenarios build a database and use all of those to, to create a global set of scenarios. Um, they both have, all three of them have strengths and weaknesses. I don't have time to go into it. It's worth simply reading what it says there because they all come with pros and cons and you can't avoid all of them. By the way, the IBES in the end took option two because they didn't want scenarios that were kind of what if, what if, what if we span the uncertainty space. They said we want normative scenarios that all that all gear around protecting nature. So they came up with their nature futures framework, which is another set of global scenarios that are more on, on system transformations than they are on spanning uncertainty spaces. So there might be important reasons to do something else than what the SSP set out, even though I'm here to advocate the use of the SSPs. This I can skip because Brian introduced it. This I can also skip because Brian introduced it. It's just to, to highlight again that the word scenarios can really mean a lot of things to different people and particularly in the, in the community that Henrik and I operate in. So those are often local, regional, national type of scenario processes. Narratives become much more important than the actual model input or output. So when we talk about scenarios, they might well simply be only stories and nothing else. So it's good to keep that in mind. Well, Brian also talked about this, that at some point integration needs to come because the SSPs are very powerful as a product in its own right. But in the end, certainly when, you, when you're in the climate change arena, there's more than just socioeconomic change. Right? Henrik highlighted how it can be important, certainly in the, in, the shorter, in the shorter run, but at some point that does need to be integrated with climate change impact signals. And this particular figure here in the bottom was shown already where you know, a set of, of global uh, emission levels were, were matched with certain SSPs in tier one and hopefully more will come later. I have one thing about to say about that, I think later, if I have time, just to, Reminder that that's, that's always somewhere needing to happen as well. Now, there are different ways in which 
uh, scenarios can be downscaled. And so we have the existing bit, which are global narratives and the global models, and there are plenty of them. One way of downscaling is to downscale stories first. So you actually develop regional stories, continental stories, national stories, and those then can be translated to model inputs and can then run a set of models that will give you both global and regional models. You can also say, I will directly downscale models. So I have global models that give us outputs and that output can directly be used by regional models and give you the regional model outputs, skipping the, the narratives. And if you wish, you can use then those regional model outputs to create your own set of regional stories. Those are by and large three ways in which you could reach sets of narratives and or models at regional scale. Summarizing though, some of the things I just said is that I think there's two fundamental choices that need to be made. And the first one really is you're going to do downscaling or you're actually going to do upscaling. So is this going to be a top-down process, starting with global SSPs, then developing in Europe many times you see the European SSPs, and you have national ones, they have local ones, it can be multi-tiered downscaling, where the global scenarios are kind of used as boundary conditions, or do you want to start bottom-up with regional scenarios that can then later on be matched or some other way linked to global level developments? And the other thing that also Henrik touched upon in my own work of scenario development, almost every, every case has some degree of a stakeholder participation. And that's often tied with more qualitative scenarios, narratives, cartoons, all kinds of other, of other types of outputs could be derived. But it is a choice whether you want to have stakeholder in, input in the actual development of the scenarios or you want this, this to be more model-based and let's say, quote unquote, expert driven, where scenarios can perhaps be more consistent with global models, but you might lose some of that local specificity because you haven't in included the stakeholder knowledge. I think both of those do need to be discussed and you have to make very clear, de clear decisions on what it is you wanna do. Right, I think Brian touched upon that first one. I think he said the word 2000. So there are two systematic review initiatives that try to, to keep track of who's been using the SSPs and been, been documenting about it. I say here 1600s, I think Brian said had the number 2000. So it's, it's a very rapidly increasing database of papers and, and other documents that, uh, that tell you how SSPs have been used. So there's a first one that's also published. I don't have, didn't have the DOI number with me, but that's also freely accessible through, I think, the Iconic website. And then there's a second one, and I'll focus a bit more on that one that's just been finished, which actually focuses on a subset of that entire body of evidence. And it focuses on those papers that have downscaled the SSP somehow, and that also have something of a narrative component. And that database has roughly about 160 papers, from which I can conclude two things. 90% of all papers that use the SSPs are global and quantitative. So yes, we have a lot of papers, but oh, do we have a lot of papers that are really modeling papers. Even so, 90% out of 2000 leaves us about 200. So that also means that there are literally hundreds of examples of those studies that have regionally extended SSP narratives in some way or another. So that's a, that's a huge body of evidence as well. Here I have some figures that there's, there's, they look, look a bit different. They cover a bit the same indicators as that Brian already showed of this regional set of 160 papers. So I think the first conclusion we can draw from that is the same as what, what Brian already uh, um, concluded from the, the, the big database. The SSP extensions cover a large range of different sectors. And not surprisingly, the largest one is the water sector, but that's only 18% of all the papers. And agriculture is the, the second one, urban is the third, land use is the, third, is the fourth one. I think it's a similar, similar breakdown as for the whole, the whole set. What is interesting to see here, and I think that differs from also the earlier question that was raised, is what SSPs have actually been used. And you see that, although it's by far the largest class, 
of papers, only 35% of the papers used all five SSPs. And you see almost any type of combination. If you break it down by individual SSP, actually SSP2 does not stand out. If anything, it's been used less than the other ones. So I think at regional level, spanning the diversity as a use of the SSPs has been much more important, partly because modeling has been a bit less important there. The one actually that stands out completely is SSP4, which is hugely underrepresented and a, and a, and a big um, reason for that is that the, the, the CMIP6 model into comparison that span the whole range of uncertainty for emissions do not span the entire uncertainty space for socioeconomic development. SSP4 was not included in that first set of SSPs. And that's why many non-global projects are now saying we shouldn't use SSP4 because CMIP6 hasn't used SSP4. So you see a consistent underrepresentation of SSP4. Then for the, 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 scale, the scaling um, methods that were being used, you see that about half is strictly top down, which also means that about half includes some kind of bottom up element. So you see that becoming quite important in regional studies, even though predominantly a lot of studies are, are at first top down, starting from global or continental SSPs, they, they do have bottom-up elements in them. Yes, that's what I want to say about the database. Explore it yourself. You want to have other findings. There's lots of other material coming out soon. Here, just a flavor of different downscaling um, uh, methods that you could use. So here's a paper that actually says, let's not do narratives, but let's start from tables that have trend indications and use those kind of as a structured way to look across different SSPs. So you actually have mostly trends with very short stories. You have others that actually say, now let's only do models or first do models. So there were global models that were downscaled. Those were fed to, to regional models. And that was used as an input to stakeholder workshops, but mostly driving driven by, by model information. One you more can minute. also say we only do narratives. So here's quite a quite well, well cited study on European agricultural SSPs. That was, the, that was a set of narrative stories only. And then you can do the one example project. I have a few more slides on, which was the impressions project, which focused on high end scenarios. So we only had the higher level RCPs. We excluded actually SSP2 in our set for a variety of very good reasons. We didn't like SSP2. We have narratives and models all based in, in the end to feed into a regional integrated assessment model that we developed for Europe only. There's a website there that has lots of more information. Not to explain everything, but when you start talking about downscaling, loads of different things come into play and you see global SSPs feeding into European SSPs, feeding into case study scenarios, all with arrows that have different words. And they all mean different, they, they are actually tie back to the Zurich and Henrik's paper where you use downscaling in a different way, where you, where you, where you make the, 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 the link between SSPs at different scales, either stronger or weaker. But the main overall approach of impressions was that approach of first producing narratives, then downscaling the narratives and feeding that to models, and then it iterating that back and forth to get more consistency between stories and models at all the different scales. Esper, if you can move to the conclusions. I can move to the conclusions. You can also integrate if you do workshops. Don't forget about the, the RCPs that come in in integrations. Two slides. Can I have two slides of, of conclusions? I can. Yes. People use the SSPs. I think that's by and large the big conclusion that I draw from all the material that's available. There are many and they, they increase only by the day. Also on those that do regional studies. The group is super heterogeneous in what theme, what sector, how they design the multi-scale approach which method they actually use to develop scenarios, which SSPs they use, but they also have common characteristics. So as Henrik was already pointing out, very often in the end, this is about the IVA community. 
This is about climate change mitigation and adaptation options. And the scenarios serve to contextualize that discussion. So it's actually a means to an end very often. Stakeholders are very often involved and co-production methods are a big chunk of the whole methodology of developing scenarios, even though, and don't underestimate, very often I hear that, you know, local people, you only do qualitative scenarios. These people couldn't be more wrong. Many studies have very good modelers on board and do very good local modeling studies. So they also do use quantitative models. Three key points that I want to give the community. Please don't reinvent the wheel. I think there's so much scenario development. I think that part of the reason we talk here is that exactly that reason, but I think I just want to reiterate that. The concepts exist, the approaches exist, and there is really a multitude of different methods, methodologies, and tools that are readily available to be taken from the shelf. But before you do any of that, I think you need to look at that key set of methodological questions. Is it going to be top down or bottom up? Do you want to involve stakeholders or not? If so, at what point? Are you aiming for model output? Are you aiming for narratives or aiming for both? What's the time horizon? You know, Henrik's talking about generations. Very often 2100 is very, very far. The more local you go and the more difficult it gets to extend scenarios all the way until the end of the century. But my bottom line, one liner is that the SSPs are an excellent starting point to do scenario development for any study at any scale. And I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time. That was fabulous, Casper. Really appreciate it. So thank you very much. We're going to turn back to Brian, who's going to try and summarize all of the research needs that we heard. Um, and after Brian, we're going to take a two minute break while everybody online and in the room can formulate questions. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A. So Brian, good luck with summarizing all of the research needs. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> so yes, rather rather than trying to summarize the research needs that were presented in these talks, um, you'll see some of these messages reflected. But what I wanted to go through is just a, um, a relatively short list of research challenges that have been identified by the research community, and in particular have sort of been discussed and and come to the surface in uh, a couple of fairly large uh, conferences that have been held on the scenarios topic. And the most recent one uh, was just last year at EASA. Um, and so, so these are, are, are challenges that the, the community has identified itself. You will see some of the themes that we talked, that have been talked about today uh, reflected here. Um, so the first one uh, is simply keeping scenarios up to date. Um, the, the SSPs in particular were developed quite some time ago. Um, and the both the base year information, the sort of starting points of GDP, of population, of current energy systems, and so on. Um, are now somewhat out of date, as are some of the near-term outlooks. For example, there's been um, a kind of widely publicized, uh, unexpectedly rapid change fall in costs for some renewable technologies that were not anticipated at the time the SSPs were developed, uh, and these need to be uh, updated as well. So this is a process that is underway. I believe the population and education projections have just been updated and uh, other elements are, are in the process of being updated at the moment. An important challenge here is though to make this somehow sustainable and repeatable over time so that we don't have to just wait you know, five, six, seven, eight years till it becomes a crisis and then scramble and figure out how to get them updated and how to keep a set of scenarios up to date and relevant over time. An additional challenge is that as we talked about in the beginning, the, the so-called reference scenarios or, or, or kind of starting point for an analysis is the, is the SSPs at the moment. And as, as we discussed, right, those don't have impacts or policy in them. 
And then the idea is that when you do a study, you introduce climate change or you introduce policies and you study what the effect of those are on this counterfactual scenario in which they don't exist. And it's been um, noted that this, the, the relevance of a counterfactual in which there are no impacts in policy in a world that is beginning to experience impacts in policy uh, doesn't make as much sense as maybe it used to. It still can play a, a methodological role, um, but for credibility of scenarios, we probably want to move towards uh, reference scenarios that do include some degree of climate impacts and policy in them in the first place. There is, of course, the question of do we need new scenarios? Do we need new SSPs, different SSPs? Uh, are some of them no longer useful and should be dropped? A couple of uh, important uh, topics of discussion here are the high-end scenario. The, the highest one was RCP 8.5 or the SSP 5 without any mitigation that also produces eight and a half watts per meter squared of, of forcing. This high scenario has been critiqued as maybe being implausibly high um, and sh should perhaps be retired and uh, a, a new high scenario chosen. There's also a lot of discussion of the need for additional scenarios in which temperature exceeds a given level and then later comes down and meets it at some later point in time. This has become especially relevant since it appears that we will most likely be exceeding the one and a half degree target. Uh, who knows, maybe the two degree target as well. And maybe we should have scenarios that exceed those targets and then come down later in temperature change and meet it at a later time. Uh, there's also a discussion underway, and this was reflected in some of the comments about broadening the framework, because as we discussed, right, it's sort of organized conceptually around these challenges to adaptation, challenges to mitigation. It's very climate change focused. And that was a very explicit um, intentional choice at the time, but it has made it harder to make these scenarios as useful as they could be to studies of other issues, in particular biodiversity, ecosystem services. As Casper mentioned, the biodiversity community has developed another framework, the Nature Futures. Um, there are other sustainable development issues that a broader framework that was sort of reframed to include not just climate change, but other issues uh, may be uh, important and useful. Um, in addition, uh, the idea of developing uh, new kinds of community scenarios which reflect the outcomes of all this work has been uh, put on the table as well. As we talked about SSPs, RCPs, they're a starting point, right? They're one of these ingredients around the outside of the circle that are used to create the integrated studies that then reflect how the world may actually look when there are impacts, when there is adaptation or mitigation policy. But we don't have scenarios of those outcomes. We have large numbers of scattered studies, and these have not been pulled together to say, for example, what does an SSP2 world with climate change and potentially with some kind of policy look like? What is that scenario? We don't have such a thing. That's a scenario of the outcomes of this whole process. Um, so there is the potential for moving scenarios in a way that would incorporate outcomes and maybe plan for them from the beginning rather than taking this approach of the counterfactual uh, without impacts or policy and then uh, adding them in, in later studies. And finally, in the CMIP process, the, round, the, the next round of climate model simulations uh, to, to follow up CMIP 5 and CMIP 6 um, is now being planned. The process has started for the next round of climate model simulations uh, based on, on SSPs of, of some type, right? And so what uh, a current challenge is to select what should we be doing next in terms of Earth system model simulations of scenarios? Obviously, we want them to be up to date 
but should we be simulating new reference scenarios that have impacts in them? Do we not want to do the high scenario anymore? Do we need overshoot scenarios? If so, what should they be? Um, as part of the mix of considerations for designing those experiments is that it appears that the climate model emulation has advanced a lot since the last time around. And it may be possible to replace a lot of Earth system model simulations with fewer simulations and use model emulators uh, to fill in the gaps. So that's a, um, a, a representative sample of questions that are on the table. There are other challenges that have been referred to in the talks here, um, but plenty to work on and plenty to be doing. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian. That's a very useful summary. There's another issue that often comes up is the SSP RCP framework was designed as a toolkit and the whole communication to policymakers. It's not exactly a research question, but it is something that the community is aware that um, more work needs to be done in that space. With that, we are exactly on time. I wanna thank all of the speakers for just remarkable presentations.